this is Cloud Security on the Dollar Menu with Arnel Manilo. Arnel is a cybersecurity architect at Richie May Technology Solutions. Arnel has more than nine years of experience in the information technology and cybersecurity industry with an emphasis on developing strategic security solutions for highly regulated financial services and healthcare organizations. Please welcome Arnel to ShellCon 2018. Thanks, everyone. So everyone, uh, morning kind of going pretty good. They started serving drinks out there. As I told some of you already, I had the luxury of uh, being treated to a few of them. So um, as time goes on, if I get a little wheezy or start giggling, uh, you, you know what that's all about. So yeah, so cloud security on a dollar menu, what does that mean? So what that basically means is there's hundreds of tools out there, all the way from enterprise grade to open source, that you can use to kind of secure and lock down your cloud. Now, obviously with that said, you know they, they range in price and cost, right? So a lot of times, especially if you're just experimenting and you want to kind of get a baseline going, you may not need or want one of the really high-end enterprise tools that can go up from $1,000 a month to hundreds of thousand dollars a year, depending on the use case. I mean, going from like Sims up in there when you get Splunk or Logarithm, um, that's another thing that they're very handy and useful, but we're not going to address those um, today because we want to really make sure that we hit a good baseline off of what you can utilize that's open source and included for a real small fee with AWS. So today's agenda, introductions, um, We'll go over what Richie May Technology Solution is and what, what we do. Um, if you're familiar with the AWS security model, I apologize um, for those who aren't familiar with it. It's just to kind of streamline and you'll see it again in the future. So um, then other than that, we're gonna dive into what really drives this conversation and that could be you know breaches, public um, loss uh, of, of uh, reputation and then also state laws. It could also be compliance reasons and everything like that. So, what we're really gonna focus on on this presentation are some of the state laws that are coming out that this could impact AWS workloads. And then after I'm done going over all that boring stuff, we'll, we'll dive in a little bit into the fun part where um, I'll show you some good tools that you can use that are um, on GitHub, they're open source, so to do some basic recon or some publicly available sites, you just need an account to sign up to use. And after all that stuff, and I show you how to find all this stuff, okay, I found all these things and these issues, now how do I lock it down? And I'll go over some use cases and ways to kind of harden um, your AWS environment. So a little bit about me, um, excellent introduction from Jared there. Um, you know, I kind of started off as a sysadmin, a help desk guy, um, network engineer, and, and as time's always gone on, I kind of had like this question in the back of my head of, cool, I got all this stuff working, but how do I secure it, right? And so my boss is that one guy kind of annoyed with me and said, well, just go into security already, get over, get over with it, stop trying to, you know, run the show and, and cause problems. So, Start off as a sysadmin, just handling tickets, you know, sending them off to analysts to go do deeper dives. Um, and always want to be like, okay, well, what's the next level on there? And so through the course of events, you know, I moved up from analyst to an engineer to eventually where I am now as an architect. I've worked in small, medium-sized businesses, anywhere from 10 guys at a shop for the entire company all the way up to huge international conglomerates of 80,000 employees or more. I'd have to say that my favorite sweet spot is the small, medium-sized businesses because you can still buy cool tech or you utilize open source technologies, but you can make a big impact real quick if, if you needed to. You don't have to go through all the red tape um, and things that a lot of times the big corporations have. Um, I think it took three months for uh, a VM to get spun up for me at a place and uh, was not very happy about that. Um, so that's why small medium is my favorite spot. So about Richie May Technology Solutions. Uh, so we offer a, a big breadth of, of service offerings depending on who our clients are and what their needs are. Um, so we both have two real high level um, categories that funnels down to. First one is the VCSO offering, where we're basically your virtual security team. We have teams of architects and engineers and analysts all throughout the country, um, coast to coast, so you get to utilize us from there. Then we also have a VCIOSI, which is a lot of uh, sysadmins and sysengineers, uh, all the way down to help desks across the nation as well. So depending on what you need, if it's GRC, uh, one of our employees, uh, they actually built a GRC program for Walmart. So he's very, very competent, knows his stuff. You basically subscribe to our service as a monthly fee. Um, we establish workloads and, and what you need to do to help gauge that. It's not like a flat rate, you know, and then it's all, all the cart. Well, if you just want a point of engagement to come in and do a security assessment or a vulnerability test or penetration test, we can do all that stuff. So here's the infamous slide that everyone has seen. So basically they break it down to two items, right? So there's the security in the cloud. Basically Amazon says anything you stick in our environment, you're responsible for. So if you make a bucket and you throw files up there, that's your responsibility. If you spin up an EC2 instance, even if it's off of a, an AMI, you're still responsible for that resource. They're not gonna go in and patch and harden and do all these other things for you, that's your responsibility. 
Underneath all that stuff is AWS. They're basically responsible for the bare uh, metal. It gets a little bit interesting when you're talking about DynamoDB or Amazon RDS where they're basically managing the databases for you from an operations perspective, right? They wanna make sure that HA is doing good. They wanna make sure that everything is updated on the back end. You just gotta worry about what you're putting into their databases, right? And if you're encrypting it and securing it and have proper IAM rules and everything like that. <clears throat> so right here is the AWS leaderboard for incidents. So everyone's familiar with Uber, kind of what happened there, 57 million customer records and driver records compromised. Um, that's no good. Time Warner Cable came up next with 4 million. And the last one, GitHub, I really want to throw that one on GitHub because kind of like with AWS shared security model, uh, GitHub's not responsible for what you put in GitHub, right? So it's just the platform they use. So, um, but it's still, you know, a, a, an area that needs focus on. So the first one here, Uber, everyone's familiar with it. Um, basically, they found their credentials in GitHub. And then after that, they logged on with those credentials and started downloading stuff out of their buckets, right? Um, and then to add on top of that, um, they uh, tried to keep the hackers silent by giving them $100,000. So it's like, no, not only did we not implement security controls, not only did we not fix the problem beforehand or afterwards, and we tried to sweep it under the rug and pay them off to be quiet. So um, with all that being said, you know, it's a little late, you know, got to do this stuff beforehand. So uh, some of the stuff we'll talk about later, we'll, we'll kind of outline on where they should have uh, made some changes. Next one is uh, Time Warner. So buckets, holy buckets don't hold water. Everyone knows that phrase. Uh, meaning if you put a bucket and stuff up in the cloud, you gotta make sure you have proper ACLs tightened down, you have proper IAM roles, access lists, and, and don't make it publicly available if you don't want it to. Um, and, and so what happened with Time Warner is they basically found MAC addresses for PCs, account information, um, and not only that, but they had like some old databases and, and stuff up in the cloud that had code with credentials in it to their internal system. So again, don't, hard code your credentials into your stuff. Uh, I don't think anything else needs to be said about that. Um, so breaches. Uh, so basically breaches, here's a, a diagram of the states. All the yellow ones mean that they only care about breach notifications if it's electronic data only, meaning if there's some papers that get lost, they don't care about it. Even if it's you know an entire warehouse full of client data that's all paper, um, they don't care. It just only has to be electric data. now. All the other, the other colors, the green there, that means it's electronic or tangible. I kind of don't like everyone moving to electronic only because I still find value in physical data, especially if you're ever doing any sweeps or you're doing any kind of like pin testing or, or site surveillance. You can find a lot of stuff in people's trash. I mean, I, I don't, <laughs> don't like to admit to that, but you can go find business cards, you can find medical records. I worked at a, a place where um, they were dumping all the medical records into a normal garbage bin underneath the desk after they were done printing and setting the stuff off. Well, the cleaning crew came in that night, they loaded up everything into their buck, into their big, you know, larger dump, dumpsters, and then they had to wheel that across the parking lot to dump that into the bigger dumpster, right? Well, it was a windy night, and what ended up happening is the wind got hold of it, all the medical records and data got spilt out and blew all over the place, right? So yeah, of course, that's a small isolated incident, but I think where this is heading, that means that people aren't necessarily gonna care about physical security or tangible data as much as they should. And then from there, here's breach notification harm threshold. So yellow means yes, green means no. So what that means, harm threshold. That's basically saying they're gonna do an initial investigation and they're gonna see is there gonna be substantial harm to the residents or people impacted. If there's not gonna be any substantial harm, then you don't need to do a breach. So the states that have that are yes, you're gonna know. So California, if you have any breach at all, it doesn't, doesn't matter if you're gonna have an impact to the residents or not, you have to do a breach notification. And this is a lot of the driving factors behind hardening and securing your controls is because no one wants their face on the news of saying, hey, this XYZ company lost all this data and here's what's going on, right? It, it, it hurts revenue, it hurts share, um, it's, it's, it's bad news, so. Here's a specifically a California breach laws. They just signed this into June, the CCPA. Is everyone familiar with the CCPA? Basically what that, that's, that does is um, <laughs> you can sue a company if they lose your stuff is what it boils down to. So this goes into effect January of 2020. So giving companies some time to make sure they write the ship and they harden their controls and everything. However, you know, that's something you got to go out there and say, you know, if we, if we don't lock down our PII or sensitive data or, or whatever could impact our clients, whatever your secret sauce is, they can come back and sue us. 
per person. And then they come in in this big litigious battle, not, not counting just the penalties you're gonna have to go through, but all the man hours lost of having to go through, dig up logs. It's just a nightmare no one wants to go to get into. So um, definitely make sure you have a, a mature cybersecurity program. Um, some other state focuses, so those of you who are a little bit more national across the way, we're starting to recognize a shift where more and more states are now hopping on board realizing, hey, you know, after the big breaches and everything, we need to really sharpen our rules and laws because we're way behind the curve here. And so Arizona basically kind of um, dumped in there and, and, and added a little bit more um, data on there. They kind of basically expand on what PII is so that it better guides people on how they need to control things. And then um, on top of that, you can do civil penalties, 10,000 to 500,000 per incident. So that's not per breach. So let's say you had one breach, but there was several incidents inside that breach. Like let's say you didn't have MFA on, on a privileged account, that's an incident. Let's say you had publicly available buckets and other information, that's another incident. And so as you can see, as time kind of goes on, this 10,000 to $500,000, it can just add up quickly depending on who's looking at the case and what's going on. So Colorado House bill, basically along the lines of Arizona, they, they, they added more details because as being cybersecurity professionals, we need details, we need to know what we need to control. We need to know what our bounds and our rules of operations reside in. Um, and that's kind of tough with laws because a lot of time they're open to interpretation so it makes it a little bit harder, right? So what the Colorado House bill is, they kind of dove in there and they, they, they kind of clarified a lot of that stuff to kind of better point us into a right direction. And then not only that, um, you know, they want to make sure it's reasonable. So they look at the size of your organization, look how you're handling the data. Obviously, if you're making a few million dollars a year in, in total revenue, they're not going to go ask you to go purchase a huge tool and an entire security team because it's, it's not reasonable at that point. Ohio, um, on the flip side of that, basically said, we're going to add on to the safe harbor rule. And, and, and what that means is if you're following an industry standard like PCI, ISO, NIST, anything that's recognized, uh, FFIEC for federal financial companies, you're protected at that point. You came in, you're PCI compliant, the hacker or whatever was just that good. I mean, you, can, it, you can't really solve that. If you're like, man, I did the baselines, I can't foresee everything, that's why we all have jobs, right? Um, if, if we knew what the hackers and attackers were gonna do, we wouldn't be here. And then uh, to kind of add on to that a little bit, you know, they say reasonable a lot in the state laws. And, and we've spoken to a few attorneys and said, well, help us out, you know, what is reasonable? You know, w where do you guys go from? Is it just that person's own interpretation on what they think is reasonable? And the kind of common response we've gotten back from that is the state of New York released New York DFS 500. And that basically, I, I, I like it. If you actually go in and you read the law, it breaks out, okay, you need to have a cybersecurity program. And what that cybersecurity program entails is you need to have a C-level, a CISO that can steer this, can have drive in the community or in, in, the, in, the, in the organization. Because if you just have a security engineer, he can't go up to the CIO and say, hey, you need to do this. You know, you need someone who has the weight to throw around, right? And then from that, you know, you need to have vulnerability testing. You need to have a full-on program that, that we typically see. You know, do you have logging and auditing going on? Do you track your VCP, DR? Are you doing incident response? You know, what tools are you using? You have an AV. You know, the list kind of goes on. And so that's really good to have that in there. But they also allow you to, they realize not everyone can afford an entire security team and all the tools along with it. So they allow you to basically subscribe to a third party, which is known as a virtual CISO. What Richie May and a bunch of other vendors do is we allow you to basically timeshare the security team and spread it apart around the nation, right? So you may not need uh, a guy or a few people 40, 80 hours a week constantly working on your stuff. You may not be that big or have that much work. So it doesn't really make sense to invest in that kind of people where you can just you know, outsource that and have them come in and work on the projects you need to be done. So now that we're kind of done with all the the background there, we'll, we'll kind of get, dive into a little bit of fun stuff here. So here's some basic recon, all this stuff. Keep in mind, it's all open source or it's included um, inside of AWS. So you can just go out there and get it for a real minimal fee. One, one little asterisk I will say, everyone knows AWS is a utility service. So if you turn on CloudTrail, CloudWatch, and you properly don't set it up right, your bill can be a lot of money if, if you are sending terabytes of logs all over the place and you don't have it properly configured. So. Even though it says minimal fee, make sure you have some alerts and, and you really know what you're doing. Otherwise, you can get real expensive real quick. So this first one is actually just a website showed on the IO. Really like it, you just plug in the IP address, it'll go out there and scan things. So this is kind of like a crawl for anything connected to the internet. And now, you know, Google, they look at content and what's on there. Well, this is different. It's actually looking at what is that device, right? 
So for right here, you throw that in there, right? It came up with gunbroker.com, world's largest online marketplace for firearms and outdoors. You can see there the name, it's on Amazon, it's on an EC2 instance, and it's in US West, right? <laughs> cool, so I know they're running Amazon, right? Then you can kind of dive in a little bit more and you can see, oh, not only that, but it's an Apache web server and it has PHP installed on it, that's cool. Um, you kind of kind down, oh, with Windows 7 and, and 8? Hmm, Windows 7 is gonna go end of life soon. I wonder why those are publicly accessible. That doesn't make sense, right? So you can identify soft targets. And then not only that, you can kind of dive in a little bit more and you can look at all the SSL, all the search that I brought in on there. Oh, TL, TLS version.1, well that's broke. So now I have all these soft targets by just going to this website and find this information out, right? So another one's for, for the GitHub side of the house. The very top one, Git Rob, that's very similar to, to, to Shodan and, and everything, except it's specialized to GitHub. What that's gonna do is that's gonna go out and it's gonna download any repositories that are out there, bring them locally, and it's gonna iterate through them. It's gonna use regex, it's gonna use keywords, and it's gonna look for anything that's potentially PII or passwords and information. And it's a nice, beautiful web UI where you can open it up and you can search and, and, and look through things. So um, on there in the, in the notes, they say, hey, if you find anything, be, be a good Samaritan and report it and tell them to take it down, right? Now, we're good guys, the bad guys aren't gonna do that, right? They're gonna be like, oh, I got your stuff, I got your AWS keys, I'm gonna go log on to your environment and now I own it, right? Git Secrets is another familiar one. Um, and another tool here, this one's, these are all specifically for buckets. I mean, I couldn't fit them all on the slide. That's how many open source bucket finding tools there are. I mean, you could go Google them, the list goes on and on and on. Um, one thing with this though is, is know your source. A lot of these, they haven't been modified or edited in years. So, you know, you can give it a shot to, to use in your own environment to make sure your buckets are locked down. Um, but you know, just kind of keep that in mind. If, if it's been a few years, they could change up because uh, Amazon did expand the resource names to, to a longer name because they're kind of running out pretty quick. So you know, if one of those was very specific on how to identify resource names, you might need to edit the code a little bit so it can expand that and, and look correctly. Here's kind of an ex a screenshot from the very first one. Right here is just an upload of a, of a word list looking at those buckets. The very first two, they're locked down. You can't list, you can't do anything. It's just dead in the water. The, the, the number two bucket there, you can actually list, so you can actually see what's inside of there. Breaks down a little bit more to where, okay, now I can see, I can also write to that bucket. Well, that's not good. I can upload and download and see what's all going on in there. The very number four, I can actually see the ACL. So now maybe I can see that there's an account on there that has specific access to this bucket that can give me a pivot point or somewhere else to go and to attack from. Um, you can list and you can write as well. And then the very last one, you can write your own ACL, you can modify it. You basically own the bucket now. Um, not good, so never have your ACLs on your buckets to public. I don't know why you'd wanna do that, because by default it's no. Um, here's another tool on that list too. So kind of similar thing, you, you upload a word list, it goes through there, it prints out the ACLs if it was able to read it or not. The only difference is this one actually adds on who currently owns those buckets. So that could be your target, right? Okay, now I'm scrolling through and I know that, um, you know, Keith, whoever Keith is, he owns this bucket. Now I'm going to possibly target Keith and see how I can get his information. And then if you go all the way down to the bottom, all users, full control for, um, is that it's either Alex Alvarez or something, but that, that bucket now, anyone who can hit it can own, own that bucket and change the ACLs and, and, and run off and, and own that. Um, here's some other tools on here that you can uh, basically do some um, scoping and, and some recon on there. Seriously, Google GitHub find out any kind of Amazon tools, the list goes on and on and on. Um, just make sure you read the notes and kind of see what needs to be done. Some of these, you do need to spin up an EC2 instance and install the tool on. Other ones, it's just, um, you know, you get the Amazon CLI, CLI on your box or you have a Linux box so you can run it on and go from there. Um, on the last link there, it kind of stretches into the next um, phase a little bit, which I really like, it's an arsenal of tools. So that's both um, defensive tools and offensive tools. So on there, there's an open source uh, penetration toolkit for, for there from the defensive side. Um, it basically can map out your entire AWS environment, right? So if you have 15 VPCs and all the EC2 instances all across these different regions and, and everything, unless you had someone who was documenting things, which let's be honest, who really sits down and documents things all the time, you know, you'll have this tool that will go out there and automatically scan and discover and it'll build out a cool graphical interface for you so that you don't have to go do it manually and uh, it can update and everything from there. Not only that, it is a lot of the tools that can sit there and they can look at your actual EC2 instances and the roles and who has access to them 
and kind of print out a lot of that stuff. So inside of there, um, I was sharing with the Netflix guys earlier, they actually have a tool called uh, Security Monkey. So if you've, if you've heard of Chaos Monkey, you might be a little familiar with that. They also drafted a Security Monkey tool. So that one kind of acts a little bit like the AWS's Trusted Advisor, except it's open source and free instead of having to pay the premium in business for support to get the trusted model. And, and with that, it, it'll look at your, your, your IM roles, it'll look at your security groups, it'll look at your rules, um, anything that might not been used in a while. So not only does it do a one-time snapshot, it will continuously look at it. And if it can see that this rule hasn't been used in 30 days or whatever your threshold is, you can have it automatically go in there and delete that rule um, or role or whatever you decide. So a very, very cool tool. And uh, kind of transition us into a little bit of hardening AWS. So now that you can realize, you can just Google and find out all these different ways to discover buckets in Amazon resources and see people's websites and everything. How, how do we protect ourselves, right? So right here is, is kind of the root of AWS, right? It's the IAM roles. This here defines what resources and users can do what inside your environment. So you really need to make sure at the very base foundation you have this locked down because no matter what else you do within your services and hardening and encrypting your buckets and having proper security groups and everything, all of that can be overridden if you don't follow these basic controls. So basically the first one, you know, after you spin up your AWS account, you, you get your root account. What you want to do from there is basically create your IAM users and never use your root account ever again. Like that needs to go away. That, should, that your root account should only be used in very, very specific cases. Whereas, for example, if you want to do vulnerability scanning inside your AWS environment, you actually have to notify uh, Amazon that you're going to do that because they're going to see you're scanning all this stuff. Like, sure, they can't see into your assets but they can see the pipes and controls in, in, in between those and they can see one EC2 instance or, or whatever, or IP address sitting here scanning and enumerating all your ports, doing in-maps and all that stuff. And then that can alert them, they'll come hit you up like, hey, we see this activity, is your account compromised? So to kind of you know, let the guards know, hey, you know, I'm gonna do vulnerability scanning, but it's coming from this one IP address, so it's expected. If it comes from a different IP address, let me know. And so that's, those are kind of things that root account should be used for, other than that, you never really want to go on there. You don't want to sit there and create EC2 instances off the root account. You don't want to modify your buckets or anything like that. Um, from there, it's, it's real similar to, to traditional Active Directory and user best practices, right? You want to create groups that perform certain job functions, and then you want to subscribe those users that do those job functions to those roles. You know, you don't want to sit here and create a user and be like, okay, Bob's going to do this stuff. And then off you go and individually assign Bob all the stuff he needs to do. Um, it makes it hard to manage and then you get lost in the weeds and, and everything from there. One thing that is interesting in here is when you're creating policies, AWS does have their defaults. So typically when you see defaults, you think that's bad, I don't want to do it. In this case, if you have a, if they have their default CloudWatch role and depending on what kind of CloudWatch things you need to be done, they have a default policy for you. You want to use AWS default policies when you can because they're constantly changing, they're constantly updating services, there's other dependencies going on and if they update something and you create a custom policy, your role or rule might not work anymore. So in order to prevent that from happening, it's, it's good to use their default um, policies in that case. Obviously don't share your access keys. Um, I, I think I've said that about five times, whether it be with another person or putting it in GitHub, um, don't do that. And then obviously rotating your credentials, that's pretty common, we'll make sure we take care of that. Um, and then monitoring the activity in your AWS account, right? So. Define monitoring. Well, it depends on what resources you're doing, what accounts you're doing, and everything from there. So you want to make sure that you properly lock all that stuff down. Um, at the bottom of the page here is a link that basically I, I got all these best practices from. You can click on it. You can dive into there. They give examples. They go a lot deeper into how those go. And then for those of you who don't like reading, they do have a video for you. Cool. So first one, let's kind of stu step into, okay, well, I kind of know what I need to do for I am roles. How to go from there, how do I uh, harden my buckets or secure those? So for this example, you know, um, it's basically we want to restrict the buckets access. You want to look at the ACLs. You want to look at the roles. And then you, you want to step down to basically restrict it and, and doing other kinds of best practices. For example, you can actually go in and turn on multi-factor delete. So that means that if a file is going to be deleted, they actually have to be authenticated to AWS through MFA. So that way, you know, it's just an extra layer of protection. Then you can also turn on versioning and other things like that. Um, more importantly with this is, is monitoring your S3 resources. So you have all these buckets and you, maybe you have some EC2 instances that are pushing backups to your buckets or maybe you have a website that's calling 
certain images in S3 and all that stuff. Well, we need to know what's doing what, where, and so that's where monitoring comes in. And basically after that, you use encryption, so encrypt your files. So here's the first uh, bucket policy example. So basically how you get here, if you click on the bucket, you go to properties, click on the ACL, and this is what they kind of look like. So with the first one, like let's say we want only one specific IP address to access this bucket. However, you can see underneath actions, it's S3 colon asterisk. That means that IP address has full control over that bucket. So you can specify a range of IP addresses, except for that one guy who's dot 188, because I don't like him. Um, or you can do whatever else you want on there. So that condition at the bottom of it really def defines the condition on who can access what above that. So the resource arn, um, the action, and, and all that kind of good stuff. And let's say on the right there, you want to, like an example before, I have this uh, S3 bucket that's hosting all my images, right? Well, I only want this website from this URL to only read my, uh, my images. I don't want it to be able to write anything to that bucket. I don't want it to be able to do anything else. All I want it to do is be able to read. And at that point, it can only go from there. You can also add other conditions onto there. So let's say, not only do I want this IP address or this website to access this, it has to be this specific re resource name. It has to be a specific secret key or user on there. So you can add more conditions onto there that better fits, fits your use case scenario. And obviously, least privilege and lock it down to only what's necessary for it to work. And then uh, for this example, we'll say, okay, I want to get an email notification of whenever something gets created or deleted in my buckets. That can be completed in three pretty quick steps. It might take 15, 20 minutes to get set up. Basically, you have to create an SNS topic. Then you have to basically give S3 access to that SNS.